Hey everybody, it's Jim of Anime Educated, and today you're going to meet actor, dancer, uh, voiceover artist, Sam Quasman, and uh, he does the voice of, has done the voice of Donald Duck and Little Quacker, and here he is on Animated Educated. How do, how do you even sing as Donald Duck or, or a duck voice? Well, I do. I sing as Donald Duck. I do Happy yeah. Birthday. I do Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you know, like this. Okay, a little out of tune, but you know, yeah, yeah, no, close that enough. Works. That works yeah. pretty good. You do any other voices, or have you even? Yeah, yeah, I did Daffy Duck. You know, uh, hey, are you following me? <laughs> You know, and uh -huh. oh, uh, my friend's pocket hat. And yeah, what's up, Doc? Ooh, rabbits. That's all, folks. Pretty pie. Of... No, I got a top putty. I'm a little low on that yeah. right now. Well, we could you yeah. could speed that up, I guess. They could. That's it. Uh, you know, I went to the Mo Blanks School of Voices, mm. and uh, he said Porky Pig and Tweety Pie were sped up 10%, you mm -hmm. know. But there are mm -hmm. guys who can actually do it without speeding it up 10%, like me, because mm. I'm a tenor. Ah. So, uh, although I'm not in good voice today. So, but anyway, I meet Mel Blank and I going to the Mel Blank School of Voices and I do Donald for him. He does Daffy and he says, it's great. You do somebody else's voice, but I made my whole career on original voices. Uh, so he was right. He was wrong because when he passed away, it took 10 guys to replace him. And since that time, we've had, uh, you know, five or six different Bugs Bunnies, Daffy Ducks. And now we have this guy, Eric Bowser, who does, you know, Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny and Mervyn the Martian. Uh, you realize, of course, this means war. <laughs> so, you know, he does a bunch of those voices. You know, I did the Roadrunner for uh, Robot Chicken. <laughs> Or Popeye, skidipapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapap
I auditioned for Disney on Parade. I was 19 years old. I was taking dance lessons, ballet, tap, and jazz uh, outside of school. And I wound up uh, getting hired by Anna White for Disney on Parade. And uh, I told her that my teacher was Anna Chisalka, and she loved Anna because Anna had danced for her in the other musicals she's done, like Music Man, Bye Bye Birdie, or, you know, all that stuff. And so I had a very strong ballet background, jazz tap background. And so she hired me and I wind up in this Disney show with Patrick Swayze. You said that Patrick Swayze did uh, did a voice yeah. too. So Yeah, he could do a great Donald Duck. He could do it in Spanish. You could see it on Conan O'Brien. He does Donald Duck on Conan O'Brien on one of those YouTube channels. He was Prince Charming in the show and I was the lead alligator in Fan Kate. Fantasia. So you were you in a costume as the Yeah, as... I was in an alligator costume. Oh wow. And I had a pot of do the hippos. I had a you know, and they were in these big fluffy costumes. Right. And the first night I'm in, I'm supposed to stand in front of a chaise lounge. She the um the hippo runs, jumps in the air, I get out of the way, lands on the chaise lounge and rolls down stage. <laughs> that was the choreography. Right. First night I'm in. I say, come on, hippo. I'm hiding the chaise lounge with my cape. Comes running down, jumps in the air. I get out of the way. No chaise lounge. They didn't uh, They didn't do it. So he lands flat. He's oh. flat and he's dirty. So he's oh. pounding himself out to fluff himself up again. And dirt's everywhere. And he's like, I'm going to kill you, Sam. You did. Where's the chaise lounge? I'm going to kill you. So the next thing is we we do bump, da-da-da-da-da-da, bump, da-da-da-da-da, bump, da-da-da, bump. You know, it stands to the hours. So with these big jumps, big jumps in these big, heavy costumes and the hippos lead us and we chase the hippos around going bump, da, 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 jump, da, 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 jump. So the next night we make sure that chase lounge is there. So I go, come on, hippo. He goes, are you sure it's there? I go, yes, it's there. It's there. It's definitely there. Are you there? Okay. Yeah. He says, definitely there. I go, turn around and look. It's there. Come on. He runs, runs, runs. There's water on the stage. He slips and hits his crotch on the corner of the chaise lounge and falls down. Oh. And he gets up because he's the lead hippo. And we have to do this big jump, bump, da 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 bump, da da right? And he grabs him, he grabs his crotch, and I go, everybody, grab your crotch, do what he does. And we go, bump, da 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 bump, da 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 bump, da da bump. Barely make it around. <laughs> That's what happens in a show. Uh, in 70 to 72, I danced in the show. And then Anna had an audition for MAME. I got into that because I was a pretty good dancer back then. And I didn't realize these guys were the best in the business. I mean, sh yeah, Anna, you had to have, you had to be a certain level of dance if you couldn't do what she wanted. And she had a strong ballet background. So, you had to do double attitude turns in the dirt, which I know you don't know anything about. You don't know what that is. You turn around and you crick, crick. It's like an arabesque, but you crick your leg. You know, mm. you mm. bend your leg and the knee behind you. Mm. And then you twirl twice. Mm. And yeah, wow. many times, many times. <laughs> in the <laughs> and then dirt. They hired me to, yeah, they hired wow. me to jump over fences and bushes and stuff like that. Yeah. Because I'm 23, these guys are like 30 and 40 years old. Right. <laughs> I go, okay, let's do that again. Shut up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when you did the Bob Newhart show, I mean, you had to audition, or they just knew you, or how did you? Oh no, no, get that it's job? funny because back then there were no cell phones, no internet, no nothing, no computers. So oh. they put an ad in Variety, hmm. and they were looking for a ventriloquist, and they described the bit you know, that it was a dummy that wanted to leave the act. And I said, I called him up right away. And I lived down the block from CBS Studios. I really was about a block away. I called him up, said, listen, because at that time, I was working at the comedy store, okay? I was a regular. And these comedy writers would come in and steal your jokes. And the next week, it would be on TV and a sitcom. So there'd be fist fights in the back. Then people were banned from, you know, writing things down or bringing notepads into the or recorders into the into the comedy store. Well, I called up and said, yeah, it sounds like somebody saw my act and is stealing my act because that's what they do. So. So I uh, I I Sharon Himes is a guy. I got right through to the casting lady. She goes, well, 
okay, why don't you come in and show us, show us? I said, okay, she says, you can come in now. So I said, okay. So I went over there on a Friday at four o'clock and I went in and I said, you know, it sounds like you guys are doing my, somebody's semi-act at the comedy store. He said, well, do it for us. So this is Glenn and Les Charles and Lloyd Garver and all these big guys who wrote uh, Mary Tyler Moore and they went off to do Cheers and Taxi. I do my act and they're laughing their asses. I mean, they're la- excuse me, laughing themselves silly. And they go, okay, show up at Monday. You got the job. It was that cast. I don't know if they interviewed anybody else. I have no idea. So I showed up Monday for our table read. And on Tuesday, we started uh, rehearsal. I memorized uh, Monday night. And then blocking on Thursday, you know, I get to know Suzanne Pochette. Peter Bonners has taken me out to lunch. I didn't hear a word he said to me. I was so mesmerized. I don't know what he said to me. I'm sure it pissed him off because I'm just sitting there going, okay, 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 whatever. You know, Whoa. I don't know what to tell him. So uh, I was just, you know, even though I'd worked with, you know, big stars before that, for some reason, this is a sitcom and, you know, everybody was so nice. So Suzanne Plachette comes over and gives me a kiss on the cheek for good luck. And I say, this is rehearsal block, dress rehearsal. So I said, well, you know, I have a girlfriend. And she says, so what? I have a, I have a husband. He's right over there. And she laughed so hard. Oh, that was hilarious. And I was just a dumb kid, you know, 28 years old. For some reason, I wasn't that, you know, I was a little naive. But it was fun, you know. And Bob tells everybody it's his favorite episode. So that's what I do. Anyway, end of story. (laughs) You had a a great story about Lucille Ball. Oh, yeah. She told me stories. Oh, my God. I would go over to her and say, you know, I like the Three Stooges. She'd go, oh, oh, bad props. They almost killed me. And then she would relive right in front of me, you know, about how, you know, she's powdering her nose, you know, and her face with this very fine powder and a stooge comes by and turns on the fan and she goes, <gasps> and it goes in her eyes and her mouth and her nose and her ears. And she's like in the hospital for three days. She can't breathe, you know, and they're trying to save her. And she goes, for two weeks and I walked around blinking like this and it was like sandpaper. And she literally relived it in front of me. So, but the secret with Lucy was she never turned down work. She worked, she worked. I mean, she put in an 18 hour day on Maine. And I spent a month dancing in that one number. And then believe it, this is a true story. And I, if she hadn't told it to my face, I, I would, you wouldn't believe it. It's World War II and she's driving to MGM Studios. True story. I swear to God. He's right to my face. She says this. She goes, you know, I'm driving around. I had to get a filling for a tooth, you know, and it wasn't silver. It was some other uh, material. And I start picking up radio waves and I'm listening to, uh, you know, obviously there was no rock and roll back then, but she's got like, you know, it's either Nazis or Japanese, you know, I, I thought she said the Nazis. So she's driving around. It gets louder and louder as she goes to MGM and it's in her tooth. And you know, it gets louder and louder. So she calls the police, the FBI. They drive around and drive around, and uh, they get to an apartment building that's on the top of the part the bar, the apartment building. They find a nest of spies, either Nazi spies or Japanese spying on MGM. And so they caught them because her tooth was tuned into their radio waves. So there you go. And if if you if she hadn't told me to my face, do you think you would have? You think you would have believed it? Oh, oh it was hilarious, and but she was dead serious. I mean, she wasn't funny off stage. She was serious, but you could talk to her, mm-hmm. like um, Bob Preston. Um, you know, we're taking a break. Lucy's on a horse, and they're lighting her, and uh, Bob goes, "Oh, you know, I think I'll sit with the women." So he goes over to the chorus girls and they're, they're sitting on these bleachers for, you know, they have bleachers so they can rest. And the girls go, oh, Bob, oh, Bob, oh, wow, Bob, Bob goes right, sits right in the middle and goes, ah. And Lucy goes, hey, Bob, how's your wife? Everybody laughs. Bob goes, fine, how's yours? She laughed, we laughed. <laughs> she laughed first. But she was very easy to to uh, talk to, anything you wanted to know. I, I was so stupid. I just said, you know, Lucy, I, I want to be an actor. You know, I do Donald Duck and I'm, dan- I'm a dancer right now. And But I 
you know, she probably would have helped. She's these guys are so successful that they, you know, Ed Asner did that for me. You know, he saw everything I ever did. He, I was friends with him for 50 years. I choreographed him in a musical and Mr. One or two Emmys at the time. He was Mr. Seven Emmys, actually, he won seven. And I, every time he'd win an Emmy, I'd call him up and go, what? Like, there are no other actors? Like, you're the only one? Come on, man. <laughs> he starts, he goes, he says, I hope it doesn't, you know, um, I hope it doesn't price me out of the business. And every great actor that I know or director that won an Emmy or a writer that won an Oscar, they all said the same thing. I hope it doesn't price me out of the business. Every single one. So, you know, the old joke, you know, well, who's Richard Dreyfus? Get me Richard Dreyfus. Get me someone like Richard Dreyfus. Who's Richard Dreyfus? That's that's the life of an actor. <laughs> so anyway, those are my stories. You were you were um, Donald Duck for Disney for a certain amount of time, and then yeah. then you became Quacker for uh, yeah. Twenty five for... years later, uh, the executive producer calls me up, actually emails me and says, "You, you still do a good duck." And I go, who are you? <laughs> okay. He goes, well, I was the, uh, uh, you know, um, the animation supervisor at Disney Studios for a big movie. And you came into the the Disney Studios and uh, into the, our animation department and did the best Donald that I ever heard. You know, this shouldn't be a stretch for you. And I wrote back, it shouldn't be a stretch for me. <laughs> and I got the job and I go to the cast party with all the other actors, voice actors, animators, writers, you know. And uh, there's the casting director. And the casting director says, oh, God, she goes, it's great. You know, you got this part. You were always our first choice. We had to go through 3,000 voice actors for that little duck. How about that? So that's how hard it is to get a job. But to re be remembered 25 years after you do a, a, a duck, you know, or a character, that's a compliment. And I'm so grateful to him for that. He was the kindest man, uh, generous. He even let me write stories, submit stories. And I sold about four or five of them for Quacker and Tom and Jerry, you know, and uh, he he thought I had a gift for writing. And so I would come up with stories and they loved the ideas. You know, Quacker finds a lucky penny. That was perfect. Flamingo a go-go. I wrote that, you know, I submitted the story. So, you know, to allow me to do more than just a duck was uh, was a great compliment. And I'm forever grateful to him. So every year I send him a box of chocolates, <laughs> box of seized candy. I don't know what else. To I send him flowers. People would talk. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But he's a wonderful when I was in Boise, Idaho. Uh, next to me was Joey Daria, who played Butch and Droopy Dog, you know. Little bang, you did. And uh, he was sitting next to me. And uh, we had worked on Tom and Jerry. And I really never met him before that. You know, because when you go in to do a voice, usually you're the only one there. Mm -hmm. Or the other person is comes in right after you leave. So it's very separate. So have you yeah. been auditioning for any of the uh, video games? Yeah. Finally, I have an agent that is putting me up for video games and anime. And, you know, I did Robot Chicken and and uh, I did that for 10, 11 years. I did the Road Runner. I did Huey, Dewey and Louie, one of those. And I did uh, I've always did Donald Duck for them. And that'll keep me out of Disney Studios for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, Robot Chicken is a lot of fun. I got to tell you, Seth Green, what a wonderful guy. I mean, just just a generous man. You know, as a matter of fact, I, I was at the 100th episode of uh, Robot Chicken and we had a big party and there was George Lucas. And Seth said, this is George, this is Sam, you know, he does Donald Duck for us. And I said, you used to do Donald Duck at Disney. He goes, no kidding, come here, come here. So I go over to the side with George. You think I would be smart enough to ask for a job, right? What an idiot. And he says, uh, he says you know, I wanted that. I wanted that Donald Duck voice for Howard the Duck. Oh. But if I if I used it, Universal said that Disney would sue me to death. A little stronger words than that. Mm -hmm. These guys at the top, they're generous people. I mean, the really good ones, they really are open, kind, uh, you know, uh, 
they're easy to talk to. I mean, they want to know about you. Uh, you know, you just hope that maybe they remember you, remember you, you know. Mm -hmm. You did a little, a uh, few commercials with uh, Jerry Seinfeld and yeah. How, how did you meet him? We did stand up together years ago. He was, I couldn't believe it. George Wallace was the middle act and he would just blow out the room. I'm going, I couldn't follow you, George. I mean, you, you should be the headliner. He goes, watch. And there's Jerry gets up there. He's fearless and he kills. He, he's the headliner. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I mean, that was my respect for Jerry, uh, that he had, he was fearless. And um, I mean, really just did his thing and, you know, was, you know, uh, committed to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, his material was great. And people were laughing. I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, maybe it's my lack of confidence, but I don't think I could have ever uh, followed George. He, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, Jerry calls up my friend Barry, who's his head writer. And says, you know, I need a guy to do uh, the, you know, the product placement thing. And I, I got to get somebody funny and somebody who can do it. And Barry says, how about Sam? He goes, I get him. He can do everything. So I went and did the first one. We did it one take. He says, bring him back, you know, got to do another one. So the other one was, you know, was a dummy thing. And eh. yeah, so uh, we did that one. And I was grateful for the work. And uh, Jerry was very kind about it. He's a very generous man. And then I was invited to the uh, uh, the movie Unfrosted, the making of the Pop Tart. So I saw the rough cut. Then I was invited to the final, and that was what a difference. I mean, the editing makes a huge difference, and it got funnier and funnier. It was number one in the world on Netflix, although I wasn't in it. So, <laughs> so I forgive Jerry. So, what advice do you have for young actors, or you know, that are interested in? getting into this business they don't do what i did <laughs> don't turn down work <laughs> i mean i turned down blazing saddles don't hit me <laughs> oh. yeah see what oh. i mean or i uh you know i was on mad tv and they asked me to come back and i said well if i'm just going to be an extra i'm not going to do it but what i didn't understand was you eventually grow and you eventually get more and more work so these are things where I think Lucille Ball was the best example. She did everything. She never turned down work. From the Three Stooges to whatever they told her to do, she could do. And she wasn't funny off stage, but she could perform. She could act. She, and she was. She wanted her to be a, a, a Ziegfeld beauty. She was a Ziegfeld beauty. She wanted her to fall into a vat of uh, grapes. She could do that. You know, and that's why she's a legend mm -hmm. you know so that's wow. my advice my advice is learn just open keep growing never stop learning that's the whole key to acting and every project you do as an actor you grow from that you learn something you know listen to uh the uh, the older actors, they really have the experience. You know, Michael Caine, you can see him on YouTube. He'll give you an acting lesson. Uta Hagen says, if you're a dancer and you stop dancing, you have to go back and retrain because you lose it. If you're an actor, you have to keep acting. You have to do one play after the next, or you, you know, if you're a stand-up comic, you have to keep writing and keep getting up and performing. You know, dancing, acting, singing, you know, playing the piano. Once you stop, like I played the piano and I stopped for a long time. I got back and I was like, what happened? Mm. You know, what happened was I didn't keep it up. Right. So if you want to be an actor, and that's why a lot of people, they dedicate themselves to that, that uh, experience as an actor to do all these different things. And they wind up, you know, tragic sometimes. And sometimes they wind up extremely successful. And they do have a, a family or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or something, you know, to support them, help them emotionally. Uh, and it's it's a hard road. That's life. That's just part of life, you know. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, on that downturn, yeah. <laughs> no, go to I... my website, samkay3000, 3000, 3000.com. 
You can see all my work and I'm waiting to do another autograph show. But I just did the Hollywood show in Burbank a couple of weeks ago. That went really well. Oh, good. good. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on Anime Educated and, you know, talking about all this stuff and <laughs> teaching us all about acting and telling us all these great stories. That's all, folks. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Sam Quasman. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this interview in any way, you can press that button right there to subscribe or you can scroll down and look at other videos I have. And I'll even put some of these videos up here. This one's a really good one if you're interested in uh, more about uh, voice talent as well. So see you next time on Animated Educated.